thank you, Chairman. Ladies and gentlemen, I've, uh, I've been told to come and stand here so that you can uh, hear me uh, using the, the microphone. Uh, well, uh, Bernard, great to listen to you. We heard a lot about what grammar schools and selective education were like in the 1950s. We heard a lot about what they were like in the 1960s. We heard uh, from Bernard about the failure of too many secondary modern schools in those decades. And we heard, didn't we, about how terribly unfair it was for the majority of children not going to grammar schools in those decades. Uh, I have uh, a problem in this uh, debate because not only did I go to a grammar school, Altrium Grammar School, which is a very fine school and a better school today than it was when I was a boy there. Uh, I also, uh, having benefited from the opportunities that I was given in the Trafford Grammar School system, uh, have become the Member of Parliament uh, for part of the borough of Trafford. So I'm afraid, Bert, that my problem is that I know what the system's like now. I know what it's like today. And what we did in Trafford and the places where we have kept selection was use a little bit of logic and a little bit of common sense. <laughs> if in the 1950s and the 1960s the problem was that the grammar schools were succeeding, they were providing the social opportunity that Bernard talked about, uh, then the, and the problem was the failure of the secondary models. You're all educated people here. What would you do? Would you get rid of the bit of the system that worked, or would you get rid of the bit of the system that didn't? So what we've done in Trafford, what we've done in my constituency, is raise the standard of the secondary model. We call them high schools. In Northern Ireland, they've done the same, where the attainment in those high schools is superb. So I say to Bernard, he talked about a golden age of grammar schools. For those of us who are fortunate enough still to have grammar schools, the golden age is now. It's a golden age for selection, when you are selecting the right people to go to the right school, and everyone gets to go to an excellent school. And yes, people going to the very good high schools in my constituency have smart blazers too, I'm pleased to say, and they don't feel that they are consigned to failure. Uh, when they go to a school like Wellington, which gets better results than most of the all-ability comprehensive schools in Leafia, Cheshire, nearby. So, yes, I believe, because of my own experience, I know that if I had stayed in Salford, where I was born, my opportunities would have been dramatically less than they were because my parents moved to Templey when I was four years old. I happened to have the benefits of the selective system, as Robert did and he tells you about too. Um, fundamentally, I believe in the system because it works. It's not about ideology, it's not about uh, some rose-tinted view of the past. It's looking at a system that delivers. And if you look year in, year out, at the authorities which are at the top of the league tables, you find that eight out of ten of the best local education authorities in the country are either selective or are partially selective. If you look at the results for every single ethnic minority group in the country, all do better in selective systems, not in comprehensive systems. But there's no mystery in this. Almost everybody now in education recognises that it is better to teach by ability. It's easier to focus on a smaller part of the ability range. The question is, uh, do you do it by banding and streaming and setting within schools, or can you do it also <coughs> between schools? It seems to work better when you do it uh, between schools. And we've got decades of evidence now showing it. Now, I do believe, fundamentally, that education should be about extending the opportunities for everybody, regardless of where they start in life. And if you look and what has happened over the last few decades as we've seen the retreat from selective education and more concentration in the comprehensives, you see a woeful backward step in social mobility. In 1971, of the 21 permanent secretaries of Whitehall departments, the people who really run government, not the politicians, 
four of them went to public school. All of the others were educated in grammar schools. Uh, since then, if you look at the Sutton Trust research, you see the way that the public schools, the independent schools, are reasserting their dominance in the civil service, in the professions, and in politics. Evidence in the newspapers today from the Sutton Trust looking at the candidates for parliament, looking at the way in which increasingly independent education is coming to dominate our democratic institutions too. Half of the Conservative candidates in winnable seats were independently educated. And that's a party which had leaders for many years, uh, from Ted Heath and Margaret Thatcher and John Major, who have been educated in the state sector. 31% of all of the candidates of all parties likely to win come from independent schools. That's 7% of the population independently educated. And if you look at the evidence of social selection, are these opportunities open to everyone, or is it better, as Bernard says, in comprehensive systems? The Sutton Trust looked at the most socially selective schools in the country. 91 of the most socially selective 100 schools in this country are comprehensive schools. Uh, they are selecting by house price, they're selecting by social class, they're not selecting by ability. And recently, we saw research on the best local authorities in the country for getting people into Russell Group universities like <coughs> this one. And there is only one local authority in that top 20 list that comes from anywhere outside the south of England. Across the whole of the North and the Midlands, the only authority is mine, Selective Trafford. Ladies and gentlemen, it works, and we should give people that opportunity. Thank you.